Welcome. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the top 15 most severe symptoms that often come with depersonalization. Now, these 15 symptoms are not all symptoms of depersonalization. Really, depersonalization and derealization are trauma coping mechanisms. And whenever you're in a state of trauma, you're going to be experiencing a combination of trauma symptoms such as depersonalization, derealization, time can feel distorted, your memory can be thrown off, things like that. But also people will usually experience fight or flight symptoms, what we call anxiety and panic, which would be like heart palpitations, light sensitivity, anxious thoughts, and a whole host of other symptoms but in the most severe state of trauma there's actually no anxiety symptoms whatsoever and so you might be experiencing depersonalization realization time can fill off your memory can fill off and things like that but there's actually no anxiety whatsoever so anyway I want you to know that some of these symptoms are going to be trauma symptoms, other symptoms are going to be anxiety symptoms, but depersonalization realization are from trauma. And trauma is actually a state of nervous system overwhelm. It's not an event at all. And there are virtually unlimited ways that you could end up in this state of nervous system overwhelm. Most people that I work with, my clients that come to me, it's complex trauma, meaning that it was not just one big bad event. It was a series of stressors and adversity that built up over a very long time. Time, you could say like filling up water in a glass and then eventually there's something that happens you could say this is the straw that broke the camel's back it's the drop of water that comes in and causes that water in that cup to overflow and that's a trauma state right and so it could have been a bad marijuana experience or a bad drug experience it could have been a breakup it could have been getting fired from work or it could have been something relatively small it really just depends on the person for me initially what caused me to enter a trauma state was a bad marijuana experience but i want you to know there was lots of stress and fatigue that was building up before then. And so it didn't take much for me to reach that trauma state because there was already so much buildup. So with these 15 symptoms, it's gonna be some trauma symptoms and some anxiety symptoms. So let's go ahead and get into it. Also, yeah, click like if this helps you. Subscribe, join the trauma-free family. Comment something below if you have any questions. Also hang around to the very end. I'm actually gonna give you access to a free 45 minute training that I've created for you that will help you on your journey of healing from depersonalization and derealization. All right, so the first, symptom is feeling detached from your body. So this is depersonalization. And as I mentioned, it initially showed up for me after a bad marijuana experience. I basically smoked just way too much marijuana. I had a full blown panic attack and I ended up running outside and pacing back and forth. And I suddenly felt as if my soul detached from my body. I started to experience my body from the outside in versus the inside out. And it wasn't a full out of body experience. It's not like I was, you know, standing 20 feet away, like, hey, what's up, buddy? You know, it wasn't like that. But it felt as if I lost all connection to my body. And it felt as if I was about to fully attach from my body. I looked down at my hands, and they felt like they were not my own hands. And it felt like my body was essentially a suit that I was wearing versus something that I was connected to. And it almost felt like my mind was kind of hovering just above my body and then a little bit to the right. Again, not like a way out there, out of body experience. That's not what I'm talking about. But I basically just had this extreme sense of disconnection. And whenever I started to experience that, I mean, I was already panicking, but that symptom caused me to absolutely freak out. I literally thought that I was dying and I started screaming to my friends, call an ambulance. I'm going to die. It's over. And they wouldn't call an ambulance because they were afraid that they would get caught with the weed. And so I felt trapped and I felt overwhelmed. And that's when trauma happened. That's whenever stress turns into traumatic stress is the point of overwhelm. And whenever I hit that point of overwhelm, that's whenever depersonalization, realization, as well as other trauma symptoms started to kick in. And so what even made it more scary was that although the feeling of detachment faded for a short period of time after I woke up the next day, the symptoms did come back, which I experienced depersonalization, realization, time felt distorted and all kinds of other symptoms. They didn't go away. No matter how many methods that I tried, the symptoms would still be there. And sometimes I would feel mainly detached from my head. Sometimes I would feel mainly detached from my arms. Sometimes I would feel mainly detached from my legs. And sometimes I would feel 
again, like I was about to have an out of body experience and my entire body felt foreign to me. It felt like my soul and my body were detached. And when these symptoms would happen, it made it absolutely impossible to focus on anything else than this feeling. It was literally the most terrifying thing that I've ever been through. There's nothing more terrifying than feeling detached from your body. And what's even more frustrating is whenever you try to explain it to people, nobody gets it. I remember trying to tell my friends and family, hey, I feel detached from my body and hey, everything feels dreamlike, which would be derealization, which we're going to talk about in a second. And they kind of looked at me with this deer in the headlights look of like, oh, you, you feel detached from your body? Everything feels dreamlike. Are you okay? Like, are you, are you like, do we need to go see somebody like they literally thought that I was nuts and it's an invisible symptom. It's not something that you can like cut with a knife. It's not something that you can see on a test. Like it's something that is absolutely tormenting, but from the outside, it actually can look like everything's fine. You know, maybe if you're having a panic attack, you know, people will notice, but you can feel literally detached from your body and feel like everything's fake and dreamlike. And yet on the outside, people wouldn't even notice. And it becomes extremely frustrating because people don't understand the level of torment that you're facing. But anyway, depersonalization is extremely uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. It's there because of a state of trauma, which is a state of nervous system overwhelm. And it's actually there to protect you. It's designed to make you feel so detached from your body that if you were being eaten by a lion, you wouldn't feel it as much. It's essentially nature's last gift. If you're going to be eaten by a lion, you might as well not feel it, right? But let's go ahead and break down the neuroscience of why depersonalization happens just in case that you were curious. There really hasn't been enough research done to conclusively determine the exact parts of the brain that shut down that cause depersonalization, but here are four parts of the brain that are believed to be influenced during a state of trauma that caused depersonalization. The first part of the brain is the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for processing emotions and during a state of trauma, the amygdala becomes hyperactive, which can lead to an emotional overload. And this may cause the brain to shut down or dampen emotions as a protective mechanism, leading to emotional numbing. Emotions are experienced in the form of physical sensations in the body. So if you become emotionally numb, it means that you're no longer experiencing the physical sensations happening in your body. And that physical detachment that I mentioned earlier, which leads to the feeling like your body is just a suit. Remember, I talked about it. It feels like you're experiencing your body from the outside in and not the inside out. You're no longer experiencing the normal inner emotional physical sensations that you're used to experiencing and thus your body feels like a suit versus something that you're connected to. The second part of the brain that is influenced during trauma is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is involved in executive functions such as decision making, self-awareness, and emotional regulation. But research suggests that during trauma, the prefrontal cortex may become hypoactive active, meaning less responsive, and this reduced activity can contribute to the feelings of detachment and disconnection from one's body and emotions experienced during depersonalization. The third part of the brain that is influenced is the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a central role in memory formation and consolidation. And in response to trauma, the functioning of the hippocampus may become disruptive, leading to difficulties in forming coherent memories during the state of trauma. This disruption may contribute to a sense of unreality and disconnection from the experience, which are characteristic of depersonalization. Lastly, the fourth part of the brain that is influenced is the insula. The insula is involved in processing bodily sensations, emotions, and self-awareness, and altered activity in the insula during a state of trauma may contribute to the feelings of detachment and the perception of altered bodily sensations that are often reported in depersonalization. Number two, feeling detached from reality. This bizarre sense of disconnection from the material world is known as derealization and was also absolutely terrifying for me. Derealization makes you experience the world in a way that feels foggy and dreamlike, as if you're looking at everything through a blurry lens. Colors, sounds, and other sensory experiences may seem muted or dulled. The only way that I can describe it is that it feels like you're a zombie who's sitting in a movie theater watching your life play out before you, but the movie is on mute, it's in black and white, and it's happening in slow motion. And you feel like you're a detached observer of this movie and you're not experiencing your life directly. So why does this happen? 
Derealization, like depersonalization, is a trauma coping mechanism. By dissociating the person from the external world, the individual may feel less afraid, less pain, and less overwhelmed, which can allow them to focus on survival and escape if there was a life-threatening situation, which again is what your brain thinks is happening. I understand, but the vast majority of you who are watching this, you're not in any physical danger probably 95% of you, some of you are in physically abusive situations, which means that you need to leave. That's absolutely essential. But for most of you, there's literally no danger whatsoever. It's just been the accumulated buildup of stress and fatigue over a very long period of time. And eventually things got so built up, you could say that you were like a pressure cooker and the pressure got so severe, so intense in your nervous system that derealization kicked in to create a mental buffer between you and the source of the life-threatening danger, which in this case, there was no danger. It was just the buildup of stress. So the very buildup of overwhelming stress itself communicated to your nervous system that you were about to die and derealization kicked in to help you and make that death less painful. This feeling is extremely uncomfortable. It's debilitating out of all the symptoms that I experienced during trauma whenever I used to suffer that was literally one of the most debilitating. Depersonalization and derealization were the most terrifying thing that I ever went through, but I am now free of this, and you can get out of this as well. We simply need to get you out of a traumatized state. I say simply, it's simple in concept, difficult in execution, but you can do this. And as far as the science behind this, the same parts of the brain that cause depersonalization that we mentioned earlier are believed to be the same parts of the brain that are affected during trauma that also cause derealization, as well as the next few symptoms that we're going to talk about. Number three, friends and family start to feel like robots. Your friends, family, and people in general may start to look and feel as they are robots instead of actual people. It's very difficult to explain, but this was for sure one of the more bizarre experiences that I had. It's almost like I was projecting my own depersonalization onto others. So basically, I felt super detached from my body. My body felt like a suit, and I was almost projecting that onto other people, meaning that whenever I looked at people, it looked like their body was a suit that they were wearing versus who they actually were as well. It was extremely bizarre and scary, and this caused a lot of existential rumination about what we are as human beings and how our mind and body operate. Next, friends and family may start to feel like strangers. So sometimes whenever I'd be speaking to people that I loved and cared about, it literally felt like all the history that I had with them had been completely erased in a moment. I felt no emotional connection to them whatsoever, and they felt like a complete stranger on the street that I had never met before. And that was absolutely terrifying, but also extremely depressing. Suddenly, I wasn't able to feel the mental and emotional connection to the people that I loved, which made social interactions extremely depressing and awkward. But not only that, I feared that it would never end. I felt like I lost the most precious connection to the people that I cared about. Next, your memory may feel like it's been erased. I come across this all the time with people. So for me, it literally felt as if my life never happened. I remember sitting for hours and hours trying to remember something from my childhood, something from my teen years, even something from my early adulthood. And I would play out scenes and try to remember all the details and I just couldn't do it. It literally felt like my life never happened. And the best that I could do was conjure up just little bits and pieces here and there of memory. And this made me extremely depressed because I really wanted to be able to remember my life, especially the positive experiences, the positive memories. And it just didn't happen no matter how hard that I tried. But not only that, I would also forget things that had just happened. And whenever I would try to remember the beginning, middle, and end of events that I had just experienced, I couldn't do it. And honestly, people would usually give me a hard time about it because they would see kind of how clumsy I was with remembering things. And it actually got so bad that I couldn't even follow directions, like driving directions. I'd always get lost and even learning in school, right? I wasn't able to really remember anything that I just learned, which means that I really fell behind in my academic studies. This was one of those factors that caused that. So what's the science behind this? Why is this happening? Why is your memory so off right now? Well, adrenaline is a hormone that gets released into the bloodstream during times of stress, excitement, or danger. And its primary function is to prepare our body for action by increasing our heart rate, blood pressure, and energy levels. Interestingly though, adrenaline also has a significant impact on memory formation. When adrenaline levels are moderately elevated, our memory tends to be 
enhanced. This is because adrenaline helps strengthen the connections between neurons in our brain, making it easier for us to recall events and information later on. This memory enhancement serves an essential purpose. It allows us to remember and learn from significant or potentially dangerous experiences so we can better respond to similar situations in the future. However, when we experience a state of overwhelming stress, a trauma state, our memory processing can change dramatically. When our stress escalates to the point of terror and overwhelm, our memory transitions from registering as explicit narrative-based memory to implicit procedural memory. Explicit narrative-based memory involves the conscious recall of events, facts, and experiences, allowing us to tell a story about what happened. On the other hand, implicit procedural memory is more about unconscious learning and automatic responses like riding a bicycle or playing a musical instrument. During a traumatized state, our brain prioritizes survival over detailed memory formation, and as a result, our memory may become fragmented with sensations, emotions, and reactions stored as implicit procedural memories rather than a coherent narrative. And what that translates into is it makes our memory feel as if it's a plate that broke into a thousand pieces and it makes it very difficult to retrieve and process events. I know it can be scary, but here's the good news. My memory is now 100% back to normal. I'm able to remember things even that happened in my childhood. I'm able to remember things that happened in my teen years and my early adulthood. I'm able to remember things as far as what people just said to me or things that have just happened. Everything's back to normal, and this happens for my clients as well. So you can get through this, even though I know it's extremely scary and frustrating right now. Number six, heightened existential awareness. So the next thing that I experienced was a heightened existential awareness. I became absolutely obsessed with things like consciousness, existence, the universe, and the afterlife. It truly felt like an existential awakening that I never asked for. I would often say things like, how can all these people just be walking around and be living on this planet, right? This little planet in the middle of outer space and we're all just these little tiny humans just floating around the universe. And I kind of felt as if I had arrived at this advanced understanding of reality that I couldn't seem to let go of. One question would lead to another question would lead to another question. And what I thought was that if I kept focusing on these questions, then eventually the existential awareness would at some point go away and I'd be able to get rid of this obsession. But actually that only made things worse. You could say that the subject of existence became almost like a bug zapper and I was the bug, right? The bug zapper has this really bright light and it was like, don't look at the light. And I was like, <laughs> Oh. And I just kept getting zapped over and over and over again, but I just kept trying to beat it with my head. And honestly, I have a lot of people that come to me that are obsessed with existence. In fact, one of the recovery testimonials I posted on my channel, that's all he thought about was existence. And that's what happened with me too. And thankfully he's free and I'm free of this, but I wanna tell you, you're not gonna beat this with your head. You have to step out of the boxing ring. The more that you try to get rid of this with your mind, the longer that you're gonna be stuck with this existential obsession. But things got really bad for me. I remember pouring a glass of water and I had such a heightened awareness of existence that I literally stopped and looked at my hand and I was like, what are the parts of my mind and my body that are making me pick up this glass of water right now? And it really, really scared me. And I remember blinking and I thought to myself, how am I blinking right now? Like what part of my brain is causing me to blink as well as move the other parts of my body? And I would look at other people and think about the intricacies of how they were experiencing the world through their body and how everybody's having a unique experience. And, you know, like nobody's experiencing the world in the same way. And of course, that led me to Google. And I found all kinds of existential theories. And I was looking for reassurance, but I actually ended up just being even more traumatized and overwhelmed. Now, I will say that I was a Christian then, and I still am a Christian but I became absolutely obsessed with hearing all the theories of existence, such as the possibility of us living in a simulation. At one point, I started to think, well, what if I died and this was hell? And the more that I dwelled on existence, the more overwhelmed that I became. And it got to the point where literally just thinking about existence would instantly send me into depersonalization, derealization, and other trauma symptoms. It was really, really bad. And I would also start to have panic attacks because of that. So why does this happen? Why do you suddenly have this heightened existential awareness? Well, typically this happens because you've experienced either depersonalization or derealization that both carry with them an enhanced existential awareness. When you feel detached from your body or the material world, 
you automatically come face to face with a level of existential enhancement and awareness that you were previously unaccustomed to. So it just makes sense that that would lead to you starting to obsess over existence because now you have this heightened awareness of existence through depersonalization and derealization. The next thing is feeling like you're looking at a stranger in the mirror. So I'll never forget this one. I literally looked in the mirror and I felt like my face had somehow changed. And I'd been looking at the mirror my entire life, obviously, and never once saw anything other than my face. But I remember that one moment when I looked at my face and it felt like I was looking at my brother. So my brother and I, we do look alike, but we're also very different in terms of facial hair, eyebrows, facial structure. I wanna call this out, which if you're watching this, James, I'm just going to give you beard props like he actually can grow a beard. I don't really know what this is. It's kind of like Joe Dirt's facial hair. I've just got the, the wrong DNA, I guess. But anyway, I looked in the mirror and it literally felt like I was looking at my brother. My eyebrows felt off. My beard felt off. Even my face felt off. It, it literally felt like I was looking at a stranger. And this experience was so bizarre and scary that I literally stopped looking in the mirror altogether for a long time. I can literally remember staring down at the sink while I was brushing my teeth and thinking, is this really what my life has come to? I can't even look in the freaking mirror without having a panic attack or feeling this disconnection feeling. It was extremely humiliating. So what's the science of this? Well, self-recognition, including recognizing oneself in the mirror, involves a complex interplay between various brain regions responsible for perception, memory, and self-awareness. Key areas include the temporoparietal junction, the fusiform face area, and the insula. During a state of trauma, these areas are influenced, but thankfully, once you're out of a state of trauma, all the parts of the brain that I mentioned will go back to their normal functionality, and you'll recognize yourself just as you once did. I look in the mirror every single day, and again, I don't really have that much facial hair to work with, so I've got to do a lot of grooming just so it looks presentable. Because if I don't have facial hair, I literally look like I'm eight years old. And uh, anyway, but you're going to feel normal and connected like you always did. Next is distortions and perception of time. So being in a traumatized state has a profound impact on our perception of time often causing it to feel distorted or fragmented. I remember being at work and sometimes it felt like it took a year just to make it through the day. Other times I would look at my watch and all of a sudden it felt like time flew by and the whole day only took a few minutes. So what's the science behind all this? One of the key brain regions involved in this phenomenon is the anterior cingulate cortex, which we'll just call it the ACC for time's sake. The ACC is part of the brain located in the medial frontal cortex and it plays a crucial role in various cognitive and emotional processes, including attention, decision making, empathy, and emotional regulation. But for the sake of this video, it's also important to know that it's also involved in time perception, acting as the brain's timekeeper that helps us keep track of the passage of time and organize our experiences in chronological order. Whenever you're in a traumatized state, the brain's primary focus is on survival and responding to the immediate threat. Even if there is no threat, remember, most of you, you're in a trauma response whenever there actually is no threat, but there's been such a buildup of stress and fatigue that your brain thinks that there's a threat and your body is preparing as if you're about to be eaten by a lion. And as a result of that, one of the many parts of the brain that may experience temporary changes in function and activity is the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex. And here's also what you need to know. During a state of trauma, the brain releases stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline, which can affect the functioning of the ACC. The ACC is an extremely sensitive part of the brain, and this disruption can impair the ACC's ability to accurately process and perceive time, leading to a distorted sense of time while you're in a traumatized state. You may experience time dilation, which is when your perception of time may slow down, making events seem like they last much longer than they actually do. And this can help the brain to focus on the present moment and process the threat more effectively from a survival perspective. You also may experience time compression, which is when time appears to be speeding up, causing events to feel compressed or rushed. But again, here's the good news. That happened for me all the time whenever I was facing symptoms, and now it literally never happens. I do feel like time is moving a little bit quicker as I get older, but everybody experiences that. But as far as those experiences that I just mentioned, they literally never, ever happen, and they don't happen for my clients that work with me that apply what I teach them either and you can get out of this. Next is emotional numbness. This was literally one of the most debilitating parts of trauma is whenever I went emotionally numb. The best way that I can describe it is it felt like even if an atomic bomb would have went off right beside me, I wouldn't have felt it. 
I just didn't experience anything, not just positive emotion, but negative emotion as well. A lot of people think that they're emotionally numb just because they don't experience positive emotion, but you could just be dealing with, you don't have the pillars of a healthy life in place. But whenever you're emotionally numb, you literally don't have any emotion whatsoever. For me, I didn't feel joy. I didn't feel sadness, anger. I didn't feel anything. And not only that, but I even started to have trouble feeling whenever I was hungry and even feeling whenever I needed to use the restroom because I was so disconnected from what's called interoception, which is the experience of the embodied self. So what is the science of it? Emotional numbness manifests as a sense of detachment or disconnection from one's emotional landscape. Individuals experiencing emotional numbness may describe it as feeling the following. Empty or hollow, so you feel a sensation that your emotions have been drained away, leaving you empty or a hollow feeling inside. Number two, disconnected. You may feel separated from your emotions as if you're observing them from a distance or through a barrier. Number three, flat or neutral. Your emotions may seem muted or dulled with a lack of intensity or variation. Or lastly, unresponsive, so you may have difficulty experiencing or expressing emotions even when faced with situations that would typically elicit a strong emotional reaction. So in other words, maybe you actually are in danger, but all of a sudden you're just completely calm. But it's not calm as in like you're in your social engagement system, which is the calm part of the nervous system. It's like you're numb calm, meaning that you're so numbed out that you're not even experiencing the appropriate fear that you should be experiencing in that moment. So what's the science behind all this? Well, during a state of trauma, emotional detachment serves as a protective mechanism that allows the individual to cope with the overwhelming stress and danger without being overwhelmed by intense emotional reactions. By shutting down the emotional response system, the brain can prioritize survival and maintain a level of functioning necessary to deal with the situation at hand. So for example, you may have heard a story of someone being in a train wreck or a plane crash or a car crash, and suddenly they're able to just tap into like this almost superhuman ability to just remain completely calm and help other people. And they pull, you know, 30 people to safety. Well, it's not necessarily that the person became superhuman so much as they became numb and dissociated, which allowed them to have such a calming of all the chaos within that they really weren't influenced by all of the chaos happening around them. Number 10, complete avoidance of sensory trigger. So I remember that my symptoms got so bad for a while that I avoided almost everything. I stopped going to the gym, I stopped going to restaurants, I stopped being around people. I would get off work and then go right home because if I did anything else, my symptoms would just get worse. And that's because I developed all kinds of sensory triggers. So when we have a painful experience, either emotionally distressing or physically painful, right? The brain registers emotional distress and physical pain is the same thing. The brain forms what's called a sensory trigger. A sensory trigger means that the brain has now assigned the procedure of fight, flight, freeze response to the sensory data that you were experiencing at the moment that the sensory trigger was formed. And if we reach a state of nervous system overwhelm due to a specific sensory trigger, the brain will most likely assign the procedure of flight response to that sensory trigger to prevent continued overwhelm. In other words, the procedure becomes, hey, this makes us feel overwhelmed, so let's just run away from it. But here's the problem. While this avoidance does serve the short-term benefit of reducing stress, since you don't have to be around that sensory trigger anymore, it ultimately only makes you more stressed out because it ultimately only adds to the stress that you're experiencing because our brain assumes that whatever we run from is dangerous. And usually whenever people come to me, the gap between them and a healthy, normal life is very, very, very big. All of a sudden, they're quitting their job. And I get it. No, There's no shame. You felt overwhelmed. You tried to do it. I, I get it. There's no shame. But you got nervous around social situations, so you stop being in social situations. You stop going to the gym. You stop eating at restaurants. You stop spending time with friends and family. You stop going for walks. You basically stop doing everything. And a lot of times when people come to me, I'd say probably about 50 to 60% of the time, they're basically not doing much of anything. And again, no shame. You're just trying to feel better. But I want you to know that avoidance has actually become one of the layers of the onion that is fueling you remaining in this state of trauma right? A state of nervous system overwhelm. And so we have to fix that. And what I teach people is we need to do actually opposite of that. We need to do repeated exposure to sensory triggers plus calming the body. And if you do that continually, that's one of the things that will desensitize your sensory triggers. But anyway, this is an extremely 
frustrating experience because all of a sudden you're missing out on all that life has to offer you. And this is also one of the most exciting parts of whenever I get to work with somebody because they eventually experience what's called post-traumatic growth, which is where they do get to experience those things that they weren't able to experience before. But not only that, they get to tap in to a new level of focus and resiliency and peace that they didn't have before. So the next one is inability to concentrate. I remember having extreme difficulty focusing whenever I was going through symptoms. I couldn't keep my mind focused on anyone or anything for probably more than a few seconds. And before you knew it, my mind was wandering. I would focus on the past. I would focus on the future, or I would just daydream about something random. And so whenever I tried to concentrate during conversations, it made it extremely awkward because I couldn't do it. The person would be expecting me to be able to respond to them based on what they said. And they would talk for a little while and I would just be like, yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, for sure. So Anyway, and I would just have to change the conversation because I couldn't even remember what they said. I wasn't able to pay attention as to absorb what they were actually saying to be able to engage in the conversation. So why does this happen? What's the science behind all this? Well, during fight or flight response, anything that is not essential for survival gets shut down. We've already talked about this. The prefrontal cortex, which is located in the front of the brain, is responsible for attentional control. It's also responsible for other things like logical, critical, creative, and contextual thinking. But because the prefrontal cortex starts to shut down during fight, flight, freeze response, its ability to maintain attentional focus becomes impaired. And this leads to a decreased ability to concentrate. And I won't go down this rabbit trail, but I will tell you that I think sometimes people are given labels, and I'm not going to tell you what the specific label is, but it starts with an A. And what really is going on for some people, I would even say a lot of people, is they're in a traumatized state and that's why they have attention issues and also hyperactivity issues. It's really a buildup of adrenaline in their body, but yet people get given these labels and they say, oh, this is just, you know, I'm not gonna say what the label is, it's just a part of who I am. And then they're not able to really get the help that they need that's going to get them out of this trauma response. It's actually going to deal with the root of it and then they spend the rest of their life just managing symptoms. That's for a whole nother video. And I'm not saying that trauma is always the cause of impaired attention and also hyperactivity, but I'm telling you it's the case a lot more times than you would think. The next is light sensitivity. This was not only one of the most frustrating and debilitating symptoms that I went through, but I have currently 20 clients. I usually keep about 20 clients in my Rise Unlimited program at any point in time. Almost all of them struggle with this and it makes it debilitating because you're trying to be on your phone and your computer. Maybe you work in front of a computer or you're just driving or just, you know, going into a department store. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's literally like looking into the sun and my light sensitivity got so bad that I had to turn down the brightness on all of my devices to 0% brightness and 0% contrast. Like let's say a computer, for example, but if it was on my phone, it's got the brightness thing. I also turned off the blue light, all of those things it when I looked at virtually any light sources it felt like I was staring directly into the sun and my eyes would water and I'd have eye pain it was just really really frustrating and I remember I worked at this job one time where we had computers in front of us and I'd turn my brightness down to zero percent brightness zero percent contrast to the point that you almost couldn't even see anything on the screen. And every single day, somebody would walk by and then they'd catch how dark my screen is in their peripheral vision and they'd see me there working and they would go, how do you even stay out of there? What's wrong? Is, your, is, is that, is your computer on? <laughs> and I'd be like, no, I have light sensitivity. It's, uh, it's fine, everything's good, have a good day. It was extremely frustrating and embarrassing, but the smallest amount of light would literally bother me in an extreme way. And for a while, I started to wear sunglasses. I actually saw a YouTube video about that, and it did help because you're mitigating the amount of light that's coming into your eyes because of the darkness, obviously. But I couldn't wear sunglasses at work, and I couldn't wear sunglasses all the time, so it made it really, really frustrating. So what's the science of this? Why is this happening? Well, light sensitivity is part of fight or flight response, which, as we've shown, is designed to help prepare someone if there was a threat 
threat. And part of how the body prepares you to fight or flee is by dilating the pupils of the eyes to allow more light to enter into the retina, thereby improving the individual's visual acuity and the ability to detect potential threats. Think about it. If your pupils are dilated, you're letting in more of your surrounding, you're going to be able to see if the lion jumps over there or jumps over there, or jumps over here, or if you need to run or if you need to fight, etc. However, the dilation of the pupils can also lead to increased light sensitivity, making it difficult for the individual to tolerate bright lights. This occurs because of the increased amount of light entering into the eye, which overstimulates the photoreceptor cells in the retina, leading to an uncomfortable sensation. Next, eye floaters. I remember one day I was just sitting in a field and looking up into the sky, and I was watching these just little tiny specks dance around. I'd been avoiding them previously for years. I'd see them and I'd be like, oh no, no, and I'd just try to get away from them and try to just get away from light and all that stuff. But I remember one day I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit and just observe these things. Let's just see what they do. And I was looking into the sky and I also would experience like static dots, like colored dots, black dots, all kinds of visual changes, double vision, blurred vision, you name it. But the eye floaters were the most bizarre because I had no idea where they came from. And the only thing that I can conclude was that I was absolutely losing my mind. I was like, dude, I'm literally going freaking crazy. I was just sitting watching these little floaters just dance around in the sky I, or in my eye rather. And I was like, I'm literally going nuts. But why does this happen? What's the science beyond this? This is going to give you a lot of reassurance. So as we've mentioned, during fight or flight response, the pupils dilate, which allows more light into the eye and improves overall visual acuity to enhance your ability to survive if there was a lion, if there was some sort of danger. Eye floaters are small shadowy shapes that appear to move across an individual's field of vision. They are caused by tiny deposits of protein within the vitreous humor, which is the clear gel-like substance that fills the space between the lens and the retina of the eye. On a normal basis, you wouldn't even notice these eye floaters. They're always there, but maybe you would have to be looking directly, you know, up in the sky or, you know, there'd have to be a huge increase of light for you to be able to notice these things. But when the pupils are dilated, even relatively small amounts of light could cause you to see these eye floaters because you're so sensitive to light right now. And that light illuminates these eye floaters and simply makes them more apparent. But once again, it's very important that you know this, and this really, really gave me so much reassurance whenever I was going through this. The eye floaters are always there. 100% of people have eye floaters. You're just simply seeing them more because your pupils are dilated and there's a lot more light coming into your eyes. One example would be, let's say that my office was covered in dust, which there actually might be some, I don't see any, but I'm sure it's around here somewhere. Let's say that the walls had dust, the ceiling had dust, there was dust everywhere, but the lights were off. It was completely pitch black. Well, if it's completely pitch black, the dust is there, but you don't see it. But let's say that I turn the lights on or I get a flashlight and start shining where the dust is. Well, I'm now going to be able to see the dust, but it's not that the dust just showed up. It's that I'm just now able to see it. So whenever you see these little eye floaters dancing around, calm your body because they have always been there and they always will be there, especially as we get older. You're just simply now able to see them more. You're not going crazy and these eye floaters are safe. Next is sensory overload. So sensory overload occurs when the individual's senses become overwhelmed by an excess of sensory information. Sensory information being things that you're seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, feeling. So here are just some of the things that would cause me extreme sensory overload that made me want to just get the heck out of there. Alarms, sirens, fireworks, my phone screen, watching TV. Oh my God, TV was so triggering for me. It would induce panic attacks and DPDR, all kinds of symptoms. Department store fluorescent lights, say that 10 times fast. I remember like Walgreens and I remember walking into Walmart even and just like looking around and it's like, oh gosh, no. And I just wanted to just get out of there and I would like have to close one eye and I'd be like, you know, squinting and it, it was just absolutely embarrassing and frustrating. Also being in crowds, I mean, that was extreme sensory overload, especially if it was like a basketball game or a football game or just something that had a lot of loud noises and a lot of visual movement and there were even smells and just all kinds of stuff. I just wanted to get out of there. But even things like perfumes and cologne and the smell of gas, I was just so sensitized to it and it felt overwhelming in my nostrils. Also cigarette smoke and just really any strong smells in general were extremely 
extremely debilitating. And also I became very sensitive to temperature. I was very sensitive to heat as well as cold. So why does this happen? What's the science behind it? Well, during fight or flight response, the individual's senses become heightened, making it easier to detect potential threats. So it's essentially to protect you. The more heightened that you are, the more hypervigilant that you are, the higher the chance that you're going to survive in the end if there actually were danger, if there were a lion trying to eat you. But when there is no lion and you have all your senses heightened and you're just trying to live your life, it becomes extremely uncomfortable. Here is one of the more extreme symptoms that comes with depersonalization. And this right here is what every single person that comes to me is experiencing. This right here is a big part of what fuels the person remaining in a state of nervous system overwhelm, which ironically keeps all of these symptoms that we've been talking about around even longer. And it's the fear that the symptoms are going to be permanent. I remember walking by a fence after having struggled with the symptoms for a very long time. And I allowed myself to say something that I had been avoiding saying for years, because I knew if I said this statement that it meant that I was throwing in the towel. It meant that I was giving up on trying to recover from these symptoms. And that statement was, I'll always be stuck in these symptoms. And I remember just feeling the life drain from me whenever I said that. As I mentioned, the fear of permanence is by far the top fear of every single client that I work with. And whenever I was suffering with symptoms, it was certainly the number one fear that I had. So here's why I believe that this fear happens. I believe it's due to three different factors. Number one, from a scientific perspective, during trauma, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex begins to shut down. We've already shown that that's the timekeeper of the brain. That's the part of the brain that would allow us to see beginning, middle, and end. And whenever you can't see an end to your suffering, you assume that your suffering is permanent. And technically speaking, which we've learned this in the field of neuroscience, the way that the brain operates whenever it's confronted with things is in terms of duration, path, and outcome. In other words, our brain is automatically thinking when confronted with something, how long is this going to last? What is the path out? Or is there a path out at all? And if so, what is going to be the outcome, right? And so whenever you're experiencing these debilitating symptoms and you can't seem to get over them, and there's not a single time frame for everybody that it takes to get over the symptoms, then you see all these other people that are struggling and they haven't been able to get over them. And then you've been trying all these things yourself to overcome these symptoms and you can't seem to overcome them. Well, you don't see a path out. And so from your brain's perspective, the outcome will be permanence, right? You don't know how long it's going to last and you don't see a clear path out. So what could the alternative be from your brain's perspective, right? It's not true, but that's what your brain thinks. But specifically with the shutdown of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, it makes it so that you can't see an end to your suffering as well. This would explain why you can watch all the recovery stories on my website or on YouTube, and you can read other recovery stories, but your brain is still telling you I'm the exception. Maybe they were able to overcome this, but it's not gonna be me. But also there's more to this story. The second factor, and I've already mentioned it a little bit, is that you tried countless methods and nothing has truly gotten rid of your symptoms in the long term. You would be amazed at the amount of things that people have tried by the time that they show up to my door, which is whenever they fill out an application to work with me. I have a little spot on there where I'll say, what have you tried so far? Oh my gosh, some people have been trying things for decades. Every therapist you can imagine, every doctor you can imagine, acceptance, distraction, medications, positive self-talk, positive affirmations, EMDR, talk therapy, cognitive reprocessing therapy, EMDR therapy, that's a big one that, which I actually like EMDR therapy, but it's really only for single event trauma. And most of the people that come to me, it's complex trauma, meaning you don't have a single instance that caused the symptoms. You've got repeated stress and adversity over years, oftentimes. And so anyway, and a lot of the efficacy of even with the EMDR is how the person relates with the person who's administering the EMDR. And so sometimes they don't feel safe and comfortable with the person who's administering it and throws things off. But anyway, they've tried that. Some people try transmagnetic stimulation. People try countless things. And there are even programs out there that are specific for DPDR. And they'll say, oh, this is the cure. And they'll have all these testimonials. And then you take it and then you get taught to just distract your mind 24 seven, or you just get taught to accept your symptoms. And you try that and maybe it works for a little while or for some people it doesn't work at all 
all, but ultimately you always end back up in symptoms. And when you try to overcome something over and over and over again for a long period of time, eventually the pain of continuing to try without success becomes so severe that as a defense mechanism to mitigate pain, you stop trying to eliminate these symptoms altogether and you accept this belief that they're never going to go away. That's what happened with me. I even hugged a tree. I literally read an article that if you hug trees, it'll make you feel more grounded, which actually it did make me feel pretty grounded for a second. And I'm not a tree hugger, just to clarify. But I was so desperate to recover from depersonalization, realization, all these other symptoms that I was literally out in my mom's yard hugging a freaking tree. I tried everything, you name it, I tried it and it didn't work. And so I finally said, you know what? I can't outthink this and I've tried all these different methods and nothing is working. I'm done. I said, I'm just, this is just a part of who I am. And, and I see this in people and it's very sad when I see this. They basically say, well, this is just a part of who I am. But the third factor is that You've read blogs, you've seen comments, and you just saw people that have been stuck in their symptoms for years, sometimes even decades. And because you've had so much trouble getting out of the symptoms yourself, and because maybe your doctor doesn't really know what they are, your therapist doesn't know what they are, nobody knows what they are hardly, or maybe if they do, they just don't really know how to help you. What you've done is you've said, maybe I'm going to be just like that person on Reddit that's still suffering after a decade, or that person that I saw in a YouTube comment that said that there's no hope and nobody can get over this. Maybe that's going to be me. And however, here's what I'll tell you. I was so certain that I would never, ever, ever beat the symptoms. Symptoms. Nobody could have told me that I was going to beat it, and I believed them. And whenever people come to me, they have a very high level of skepticism. But what I can tell you is it's going to take work, but you can do this. You can beat this. What we need to do is we need to convey safety to the nervous system. And what I have done for you is I have taken, I think it took over six months to create this, but I've put the five shifts that you need to make to start to convey safety to your nervous system and heal from all the symptoms that we mentioned. And I put it into a free masterclass that you can take right now that will get you on a journey of healing. And it's not one of those master classes where it's just one big sales pitch. Like I actually tell you what you need to do and it's going to add a lot of value to you. And there's a link in the description below. There's also a link in the first pinned comment if you want to go check that out. But what I will also offer you is hope in the form of my story. I have not only been able to heal from all of these symptoms after struggling for a very long time, two years of constant trauma symptoms, but technically they came on and off for years and years and years. And as far as generalized anxiety, my gosh, well over a decade. And it was my life. It was all that I knew was constantly being anxious, constantly assuming the worst about everything, constantly living in the past or the future and just constantly feeling a sense of uneasiness. And then of course, trauma symptoms kicked in. That was whenever all hell broke loose. And there was a point where I was having 20 panic attacks per day. I was convinced that I was going crazy and I got out of this. And not only have I been able to get out of this, but I've been able to see people get out of this that everybody said that they were a lost cause. I continue to be baffled at the power of our own body. Our body has an innate capacity to heal itself. But the problem is people don't know what the conditions for healing are. And they're literally obsessed with the symptoms and the symptoms are not the problem, right? And you need to watch this free masterclass because I break down more in depth of what I'm talking about. And if you can focus on conveying safety to the nervous system, which is done through self-regulation, learning to get into a calm body, as well as co-regulation, which is being around somebody who makes you feel safe and give you a sense of hope, you can beat this. You need a body-based strategy, and you also need co-regulation, which is somebody giving you a sense of hope. And if that, and building connection with you, and if that happens to be me, that's fine. But it doesn't have to be me, right? But anyway, there is hope. And then I started to teach other people what I had learned, and they started to recover too. And you have to want it. You have to be willing to make adjustments, and not everybody's willing to make those adjustments. There is a sacrifice if you want to take care of your nervous system, but you can do this. There is incredible hope, okay? So anyway, I hope that this video has inspired you, encouraged you. Would you help me out? Please, I'm asking a favor. If you've followed this channel for a little bit, or maybe this is the first time you're finding me, but if you will click the like button, comment something below that's positive or ask a question, and also share this video, it is extremely difficult to get 
this word out there. And one of the frustrating things that I see every day is people have to go through so many programs that don't work because they have videos that rank higher than mine. And they buy these programs and they try all this stuff. And then they finally get to me and they're like, man, I wish I would have found you sooner. Listen, I'm not like an, a search engine optimization expert. And I got into this to just help people. I had to learn all the business stuff later. So if you would not mind liking this, sharing this, commenting something, it would mean the absolute world to me. I really appreciate you. And also subscribe, join the trauma free family if you're needing help with these symptoms, many more helpful videos to come. And I hope that you have an amazing day, my friend.